Hello everyone, this is Carolise. Welcome to my channel and today I am going to be talking to you guys about workflow diagrams and process flow diagrams. Isn't that exciting or what, right? So I am here on my website, carolise.com, K-A-R-A-L-E-I-S-E.com, for those of you listening to this on the podcast. So carolise.com, and if you go to the top, I have on the menu bar, I have case studies. So I have written a few case studies um, that I have uploaded to my website. There's a case study on writing the business case. There's a case study on writing the requirements document. And there's a case study on the process flow diagrams. Now, when I wrote these, I deliberately didn't put the answers because I wanted you guys to challenge yourself to do it, right? To challenge yourself to say, okay, how would I do this if I was employed as a business analyst and this was a situation that was presented to me? So I didn't um, put the answers because I wanted you guys to try it for yourselves. But this weekend I thought, okay, let me start putting some of the answers and um, helping you guys figure it out, okay? So the first one I've done so far is the process flow diagram answers. I will eventually do the API and the, I mean the requirements document, which is really an API case study and the writing the business case, case study. So let me talk a little bit about those two before I go to the process flow. So the one on writing the business case, this one is about a food delivery service um, that is looking to enter the market. And so your task is to help the executive team to make a decision as to whether or not they should be entering the market, if it's feasible or not, and what are the competition they're intending to face, you know, what's the likelihood of success, like what's the recommendation that you have for this idea, right? So it's really like a feasibility study slash business case. And it challenges you to look at the food delivery market. So you can look at Uber, DoorDash, and see, you know, what are they doing, right? What's the competitor doing? What's the size of the market? Um, what's the demography of the users who will be using these food delivery services? Should you start in one particular location and branch out? And where would that ID location to start off be? Um, what strategies are the competitors using? What are the reviews saying? Where are they weak? Where could you have a competitive advantage, right? So all of those things are questions that you need to look into to be able to do a good business case. So that's the one on um, writing the business case. I encourage you guys to look at that one and to try it, right? Try to see what you would come up with if you were faced with that. Many of you, don't have experience writing business case, many of you have never worked as a business analyst. So try these case studies, use them as your work sample, figure out how you would do it and start training your thinking to be thinking like a business analyst. The other one is on the requirements documents. This is a very technical one, so I can understand why people would shy away from this one. <laughs> so this one is about um, it's a real world scenario. All of my business, all of my, um, my case studies, sorry, are real world. So in this one, it's where because of the pandemic, people started using Teams more often than before, right? So Teams is a Microsoft application. It's mainly used for chat, but you could use it to just create Teams, which is a group of people that are talking about a particular item or a feature or product or whatever the company is doing. You can also create channels in that software. It's become very vital since the pandemic because everybody's working remotely. And so the need to communicate effectively and quickly uh, in a dispersed team was being facilitated by Teams. And many people are using Microsoft products anyway. So Teams comes with the Microsoft 365 suite. 
So it's just a natural progression. People are meeting on teams, they're chatting on teams, they're forming teams on teams, <laughs> right? And channels and all that. So it's a very good and useful application. But in this real world scenario, what I'm um, bringing to the fore is that in the case of a sales organization, like you're working in a sales team, a lot of the conversation was going on in teams and not in the sales tools. So in this case study, they're using Salesforce as one of their sales tools where they manage their accounts and their opportunities. But they also use another software called WinRate, which is where they look at the likelihood of them getting the opportunity, doing a little bit more than what they get out of Salesforce. So because Teams became so popular with the, with the sales organization, the management found that more conversations are happening in Teams that are not being transferred into the native applications that they should live. So they're having discussions about meetings that they had with prospects in Teams, Microsoft Teams, but they're not translating that into tasks that they need to do in the win rate software and also in Salesforce. So it became so bad that they're missing deals, you know, they're not meeting their expectations, they're not, you know, pleasing their, their prospects. And so the executive team decided that what they need to do is have an integration between teams and their software called WinRate. That way you can still work in teams the way you do today, but you're able to transfer some of that information from teams into the software called WinRate seamlessly. So it needs an API connection. And that API um, will also help because WinRate has a connection to Salesforce. So by just having one API from WinRate to Teams, you automatically get information into this, these two software. You get into Salesforce because there's already a connection between WinRate and Salesforce. And then now you get it from Teams into WinRate. So now everybody's connected. Now all the different systems will have the information. Now anybody can see what's happening no matter which, way, which system they're in. And that was a solution, right? That was a, the proposal. Now, how would you as a business analyst help to facilitate that? How would you know what features to, to help um, push from teams to this new system called WinRate? And in this case study, I didn't go into too much details as to what WinRate is, except for its main functionality. So you had the opportunity to create whatever screens you want, do whatever mockups you want, whatever wireframes, add whatever functionality you think makes sense. So there's a lot of um, opportunity for you to be very creative with this one, right? So I encourage you guys to take a stab at it. See what you would do if you were presented with this. These are real world problems, guys. Real world problems. Um, APIs are very popular. Um, I know it's sometimes a challenge to write user stories for APIs because it's such a system to system um, thing and you feel like the user story should have an end user, but there is a person benefiting, right? So whenever you have a system to system integration, you still have to think about the end user who will eventually um, benefit from this integration. And so that's how you, you think about it. So even just designing the screen and coming up with how, what the functionality would be, would be a great exercise for you guys to try. Now, let's go back to the original purpose of this video. Um, which was the diagrams, right? The flow chart. So the last case study I have is called Creating the Process Flow Diagram, a case study. And that one talks about a tech company. And the tech company has two arms. One is they sell um, devices in a store. Think of like your Best Buy, right? It has all these devices, mouses, computers, televisions, all these things. And then also think of the other arm, which is <clears throat> tech support. So in one, one arm of them, they're actually helping, uh, they're on an online um, sales, like, like a Best Buy or Amazon selling devices and technology. On the other arm, they're actually providing tech support to small businesses. So think of Geek Squad for Best Buy, right? But instead of it being in the store, they actually provide this to small businesses, not just individuals. And so, you know, small businesses that don't have a, their own um, tech support department would outsource to this technology company called Pixel Tech, and they would actually provide agents to help support um, 
whatever that small company needs. So in this um, case study, I go through Pixel Tech and how their business model works. And I go through how they do their in-store pickup. So of course you can always buy and have it delivered to your house and that's great. But for some items, people want to actually pick it up in the store. So the in-store pickup became a challenge with the pandemic because now you have to monitor how many people are in the store. You have to have social distancing and there's a number of other things that happened as you all remember or know, because it's still happening right now um, with the pandemic. So the challenge for you as a business analyst on this was how could you revamp the process to make it pandemic friendly, basically? How do, how do you, what changes can you make so that you can still operate but be able to keep your, your customers and your employees safe, right? So that was the challenge here. And then on the tech support side, um, it went through all the steps that happened today for them to be able to provide tech support. So I'll go through some of it. It says, the, cost, the computer given to each employee is tracked with an inventory number. So the first thing that they do is, when there's a new employee, they give them new computers and they have a tracking number, right? Just to manage the inventory. And then they also install, among other software, but they install a um, ticketing software onto those computers that they send to the employees so that if the employee has any issue at all, maybe they can log in somewhere, maybe they're having some kind of error, whatever happens, they can create a ticket easily from the software that's already installed on their machine, right? Then once they create this ticket, they, they either use the software, by the way, or they can send an email to the support at, at pixeltech.com. So <clears throat> uh, once they send this ticket or the email, then the ticketing system in the back logs it as a ticket and puts it in the queue. The support agent who is monitoring the queue will eventually pick up that ticket and then they will commence you know, to, to resolve it. First, they'll try to contact the employee because you normally have your contact information already embedded in the email or in the ticket and the tracking number, the machine number, all that stuff. And if they, you know, they'll contact the, the employee and ask if they could connect to their machine. If they can connect to their machine remotely, they try to solve it remotely. If they are not able to solve it remotely, they may have to pick up the machine and actually take it to the office and have some more tests done on it. So if they have to take it to the office, the Pixel Tech support agent will actually go to the office of the client and pick up that computer, right? And then they'll take it back to their Pixel Tech office, try to resolve it. If they're not able to resolve it, maybe it needs a second tier of support. Maybe the person looking at it is not doesn't have the you know, the rights or the skills to do all the solutions. So they might escalate it to a level two or a level three support. If that's not possible, maybe they need to send it back to the manufacturer. Maybe, you know, maybe the manufacturer needs to solve it. Maybe there's a warranty on it, whatever. So they determine if they need to send it back to the, to the um, manufacturer. If they do, um, they typically, at the point of picking up the computer from the employee, they always leave the employee with a loaner machine because you don't want to leave the employee with nothing to work on, right? You don't want them to be out of, you know, not able to work at all. That would be a waste. So they always have a, a loaner machine that they get out of inventory and they give that to the employee to use while they're fixing the original machine. Now, if they have to send the machine to the manufacturer, they have a whole process for that where they contact the manufacturer, they make sure it's under the warranty, they deliver it to the manufacturer's office, the manufacturer gives them updates, they go back and pick it up when it's ready, blah, blah, blah. Or the manufacturer drops it off of their office, whatever. There's a predefined process for handling um, fixes by the manufacturer. Once they get the machine back from the manufacturer, then they contact the employee again, they go to the office and they pick up the loaner machine and drop off the original machine and ch check with the employee to make sure that it's working and that the solution has been resolved. And once it's resolved, then they close the ticket and that's the end of that. Okay, sounds like a lot, doesn't it? How do you model this? How do you, how do you show the steps for this flow? And that's what we're talking about today, right? So we're gonna talk about how to take this, which is just, you know, like text, as you can see, everything here is fairly well written, I would say. <laughs> I mean, I wrote it, but still, it's like step one, two, three, four, five, and so on, right? So you can easily follow this, 
But I'm telling you, if you have a graphical representation of it, it really does help because it, it just, people just react better to images than they do to text, right? So having it in a flow diagram is really gonna be helpful if you have to explain something. And it also helps you to know where the, um, the challenges in the process are, if there's any overlap, if there is any, if you haven't handled when something goes wrong, like the, the no line is not there, you only have a yes line for, for your decisions, things like that, right? So having a process flow is pretty cool for, for that. I will say that there's, not, there's a number of diagrams that are used in business analysis. If you do BPMN, there's a whole set of diagrams there. UML has its own set of diagram. But I found the process flow diagram to be so simple that is very easily understood by uh, almost anyone. So even though you can specialize in these other well-known um, types of diagrams, simplicity is always good, right? <laughs> and you just find that when you use a process flow diagram, very few people are confused. Like they really understand what the shapes mean. And you literally don't have to do too much with the shapes. You just need a process shape and a decision and maybe a predefined process, maybe a few others, but you don't have to really go get carried away. That's the point I'm making, right? So here on this page on my website, I've called it process flow case study answers. And that's where I have embedded um, my uh, solution to this. And this is done in Lucidchart. Lucidchart is a great diagramming tool. For those of you who know it, there's also draw.io. There's a bunch of others you could use even PowerPoint, Word, you don't have to really get too fancy. This thing is, <laughs> it's not its not that crucial to be stuck on the tools, right? I just like Lucidchart because it's online and I can embed it in my website and do all these fancy things with it. But for your purposes, doing it in Word is fine, okay? You can use shapes in Word and you can accomplish the very same thing you're looking at right here. So how have I done this? I've started out by saying, just start the process, right? And by the way, this is just a simple process flow chart. You have different other types of charts like swim lanes. Um, there's a number of other charts that you could choose. Pick the one that fits what you're trying to model the most, right? Don't, don't go extra fancy just to prove that you know things. What you're looking for is simplicity and you're looking for um, the ability to explain something in the simplest way is very valuable. Anybody can make something complicated. Anybody can make it really hard to understand. If you can make it easy, you've already won half the battle, okay? Don't overdo things. Don't use a bunch of fancy shapes that you need to explain because people don't know what they're supposed to be, okay? Not everybody is as versed in diagrams and you really don't want to overdo it. So in this case, we're looking at a simple workflow uh, in blue are just the main steps. In orange, I think, is the uh, agent steps, and yellow is the, uh, the customer steps. Or I could be wrong, I'll, I'll see, I've done this a while back. All right, so you start the process. Now these are the terminator um, shapes. It's an oval, and it, I just put it in green. It doesn't mean you have to be in green. It just represents starts and ends, right? And things that end the process. So for example, if you do a process that has a release, the last thing, last step of the process is that you've released the, the product or you launched the product, then that could be a terminator at the end of your, your process flow, right? So you just use it to show where something starts and when something ends. So in this case, I start and then I say, the customer puts the item, this is for the, um, the in-store pickup process, by the way, that I talked about before. Um, actually, maybe I should start with the one I just explained, which was the tech support. Maybe that would be easier for you to follow. Let me go to that one first. Hold on, guys. Jumping around here a little bit. Let's go to the tech support since I just talked about it in depth. And it might be fresher in your memories. You know what I mean? We all have short memories. I know I have very, very short memory. I worry sometimes that I'm gonna get old and I won't remember my daughter. <laughs> it's, it's literally a fear of mine. Oh my God, I'm not gonna remember my daughter when I get old. Because I am just always like worried about that because I, I forget things, I do, you know. 
All right, so this one is the tech support as is process. Now it's good to have model what you see right now, model the existing process, and then you can model uh, the process you're improving or what the improvements are. Okay, so I start off by having um, a few swim lanes, and the swim lanes just help to identify who is doing what, when. Right, and what, how does the process move from one, um, one person or system to the next? So the process starts off with the employee and in the employee swim lane, they log the issue or they send an email to the support. That kicks off the, the ticketing system that creates a ticket and sends an email confirmation back to the employee. Then it adds the ticket to the queue and then the, the tech support reviews the ticket. This is now in the tech support um, swim lane. They're, the tech support is doing a lot, right, as you can see here. So the tech support is gonna review the ticket and contact the employee. Then they're gonna try to connect re remotely. So here I have a decision that says, can connect remotely? Yes. Then can you, is the issue resolved? Yes. Then you update the ticket. You send the confirmation to the employee. That basically is the end of it. Right, which would be tickets closed. So there could be another line here that goes to ticket closed. I thought about that, but at the same time, you really don't wanna have lines crossing each other. So maybe you could put another close here. I mean, this is not an exact, but that's one way it could end. Now, if it's not resolved, or if you can't connect remotely, then you go to the no um, um, direction. And then it says, do you need higher level support, like support two or support three? If you do, then there's a whole predefined process steps for higher level support. So you don't have to you know, model every single thing. You could always say, okay, there's an existing model that handles you know, higher level support. And you just put that shape here. This symbol represents predefined uh, model, which is a box with the lines in, in the corners. That way you don't have to model every single detail because it could get very, very complicated very quickly if you try to put everything on one on one flow. However, if you don't need high level support, then do you need to collect the computer to solve it? If no, then he goes, okay, do you need to check again? Do you, is the issue resolved? And we already went through the yes branch, which says that's what happens if it is update the ticket and then you send the update to the employee. If it's, if you do need to pick up the computer though, so, so this should be yes, actually. This actually should be yes. So let me go change that right now. Get a chance to see my, um, my beautiful Lucid chart with all my graphs in there. <laughs> the beautiful thing about Lucid chart is that I can go in here and make a change right away and that uh, affects the embed, so that's great. So that's that's great. See, this is the reason why you need to walk through your, your process because you could you could be um, missing something. I updated this so many times that I probably removed the, the no line and or removed the yes line and forgot to update it. So that's great. Now I see that that needs to be yes. So now you can see it updates and changes it to yes. I don't know if you guys watching this on YouTube, could see that because I had to switch to a different tab and I might only be recording this tab, so it should be fine. Anyway, let's go back. So does the agent need to collect the computer? If yes, then he goes to the client's office and collects the computer. And then he hands, you know, the, the, empl the employee would hand over the machine and they would receive the loaner machine. Obviously they're receiving it from the tech support agent. So you could even squeeze it in here but sometimes you find that your swim lane doesn't have enough space to put every single step. So you could reuse um, the other swim lanes that also affect that process, if you know what I mean, right? So the employee hands over the machine to the tech support agent, receives a loaner machine from the tech support agent, and then the tech support agent takes it back to the, the Pixel Tech office and obviously tries to troubleshoot it some more. 
right now if they're troubleshooting it if it's resolved then it goes back through here now you could have a line that goes from here over here back to here which says is it resolved yes update the ticket sent to employee but that would mean you have another line crossing this line and crossing that line it's gonna get a little bit ugly so there are cases where you can you have to put the lines just to show the flow but if you're walking this through to someone you can easily explain that without having the graph look so complicated i try to avoid lines crossing each other as much as i can it doesn't mean it's a perfect um uh uh flow chart because it could be made better if you if you were to put the lines there but i try not to make it confusing right if you're walking someone through this it's perfectly fine to explain to them what happens um at some point without having all these lines crossing each other okay so if the agent troubleshoots the issue and they determine it needs to go to the manufacturer. If it doesn't need to go to the manufacturer, then there needs to be higher level support for sure because they've troubleshooted, they haven't found the solution, but it doesn't need to go to the manufacturer. So what's the high level support person decision? It could be that you need to just buy a new computer. Maybe the one you have is just done and the warranty is over so you can't fix it. Or it needs a part and uh, they have one spare so the higher level support can supply it or whatever. So if it does need to go to the manufacturer, however, it, you know, we have a swim lane for manufacturer and they have their predefined process for how they, you know, resolve issues that are coming from their, their, their clients that's under warranty, right? Or if they want to pay for the fix, that's fine. Once the manufacturer does all of that, you don't have to map out all the steps here because you may not know what the manufacturer does. You don't need to know. It goes to them, they fix it, they return it. That's all you need to know. When they return it, then the agent goes and picks it up. It could be that they also have it delivered. Who knows? I didn't go into that detail, but the agent gets it at some point. And then they deliver the fixed computer to the office of the client. And they receive the loaner machine back and update the ticket. The employee confirms that the new machine or the machine that they got back is working as expected and the ticket is closed. And that's the as is process, <laughs> okay? So this is a stab at what this process could be. There are little places that could be improved here for sure. You guys could probably come up with another format for this. Uh, it's not an exact science, but this is definitely something that would be uh, something I would present, for example, um, if I was presented with this problem, this is something I would present to uh, the management team to say, this is what we're doing right now. And I'd be very confident to do that. So this is the as is process. Now, what's the solution? How are we going to solve for this? So let me go back to um, the process flow answers. I really hope that you guys could see that just now because I am sharing a tab and I hope it's sharing right. I'll be very sad if it isn't. Um, so let's do the solution okay so this is a solution and again the problem we're trying to solve for is that um you know with the pandemic how can we still allow fixing these computers when the computers are in everybody's homes right they're not at the office because nobody's at the office anymore so i'm going to go to full screen here and zoom in a little bit so the to be process is very similar to the as is process. We haven't really done much in terms of how we solve the problem. All we're doing is making some tweaks to what we do when it comes to picking up and dropping off. So here in gray is the change, right? So the change would be instead of going to the office to drop off the computer and drop off the loaner, what the agent will do when they need to pick up the computer is arrange with the employee to pick up the computer from their home, just like that. So the, the agent will have to drive all over town, <laughs> wherever this employee is, and pick up the computer. Now, obviously, if the employee is no longer working in the same state because they traveled because of the pandemic, they had to go wherever, and they're working remotely, then that's a whole different thing, right? You'd probably need to have in here uh, like a decision to say, oh, if they're in state or, in the city or not because you're not going to drive from new york to georgia to pick up a machine for sure right or you're not going to fly 
all the way here to pick up the machine. So it has to be another process, which would be probably sending it by courier, by FedEx or whatever, right? So that, that could be fleshed out some more here. But the challenge here is that the change, sorry, the change here is that you're picking it up from the employee, not going to a central location of the office to pick it up. And so if you have to courier it or if you have to, if you can pick it up, you know, physically, then that's good. Most companies, the employees usually are within the same city. So it shouldn't be too hard, but you have to, you probably should do a decision on figuring out where they are and what the process should be for that. So that's something you could add to this. Um, the other change is that, uh, you know, once the computer is fixed, then you're delivering it back to their home, right? As opposed to the office. So it's just really the location of where you deliver and pick up that has changed in this process. So that's the solution. Feel free to tweak it and add your own flavor to it. Uh, yeah, now let's go back to the first process that we had talked about, which was uh, the in-store pickup. So again, just to remind you, the in-store pickup process was where the, the customer could order online and they could have it delivered to their home, which is great, but some customers would rather it be delivered to um, the Pixel Tech store. One reason could be because it's cheaper, right? You don't have to pay the delivery fee. And imagine that they're delivering heavy things like television and, um, you know, you know, bigger things, bigger items. So delivering it to the store might just be more convenient and cheaper and might get there quicker because you can go on the regular delivery truck that they have from store to store anyway. So that's one thing. So the challenge here was how do you let them pick up in store but be pandemic friendly. Like how do you, you account for COVID-19 um, picking up, right? So this one is again, not, um, not a lot of steps, but let me zoom in a little bit so you can see it. So it starts off with the customer puts, in, puts the item in their cart and accesses the checkout page. This is on pixeltech.com. And then they select in-store pickup for the delivery mode, right? Then they make the payment, then you can check, is it authorized? If it is, then there's a number of steps. If it's not authorized, obviously that's the end of the process because you haven't paid for it yet, you're not gonna get it. If it is authorized though, then you display a success message and you send the confirmation email with a tracking number to the customer, right? Um, the plate, the item, <clears throat> place item in a waiting store delivery queue. So. Let's imagine that there's a queue to say, okay, these items are gonna be delivered to the store. And you place that item in that queue. If the item is delivered, that's the next check. Is it delivered? No. Then is expected delivery date passed? Yes. Then there's a delivery management process. That could include, um, maybe there's a message that goes out to the customer to say, hey, your delivery is late. It's gonna be at this expected time instead or whatever. So you have a predefined process for de handling delivery, right? Delivery late, delivery behind, delivery not, didn't make it, whatever. It's already there, so you don't have to flesh out every single detail because you can assume that this is already an existing process. If the delivery date has not passed, then just keep waiting, right? So it's no, you just check, is it delivered? No, and this becomes like a loop. So basically, if it's not delivered and the delivery date has not passed, then you just keep keep checking, keep checking, keep checking. If it is delivered though, then you send a delivery notification email or a text message or and a text message as well to the customer, right? So they say, hey, your item has been delivered at XYZ location of Pixel Tech, Pixel, Pixel Tech stores. Brr, getting tongue tied here. All right. <laughs> so then once it's delivered to the store, the customer goes to the store, right? They join the customer service line. That's where they pick up from. They have to present the tracking number to the agent so they can go and find the item based on the, the number that match. And you can assume that they have ordered the deliveries based on the number. So once the customer gives them the number, they know exactly which section of their delivery uh, storage or warehouse to look, right? And then <clears throat> the agent is gonna check, is the, does the tracking number match the item? Yes. Then does the ID, on um, that the user, the, the customer is gonna present their ID. Does the ID match uh, the name on the item? If it does, then 
give the item to the customer, right? And that is the end. So that's how the process goes. So as you can see, it's a very simple process flow. Um, and it's just a very pictorial way to show what's going on. Now, this is the as is process. Let's go back and look at the to be process and what the changes are. So here's the to be process. I'll just open that up. Okay. And then I'll zoom in a little bit. Okay. All right. So here we are. So there's not much changes here. The only thing that's changed is these boxes in green. So at the point where the customer arrives at the store location, instead of going into the store, we're saying that the customer drives to a pickup area. So maybe there's a, imagine driving up to the front of the store and uh, there's an agent out there waiting for you, right, or an associate. So they drive to this pickup area. The Pixel Tech agent takes the customer's tracking number and their ID. So they present the tracking number to the agent or and they present their ID. And then they go off and they park in a designated area. So they park wherever. The agent knows, the, sees the car's number. Maybe have maybe they have a car that writes on the the, the license plate number and the color so they can find it afterwards and then they go to the storage area they go check for the tracking number and check for the id to match and once it matches then they, they you know they take the item out of the storage area and brings it to the car and helps the customer load it into their car and that's the end of the process right so the customer doesn't have to go in the store they do not have to be unsafe right and this is how you handle it to make it COVID friendly. So this is just the, the process flow. So this is your to be process or your future state process, right? So that's how you would answer this question that I had. And again, these, to me, these are very simple things. Right? But again, it's maybe because I'm doing it so long, it seems very simple, but it's a great exercise for you to practice um, doing flow diagrams, process flows, practice how to, explain this because once you've written it how would you present this to the team where would you start how would you how would you articulate what the change is to get the buy-in is another thing right so take a stab at this yourselves um maybe there are things in here that you could improve you could make even clearer maybe you could flesh out some of those predefined processes that i have and yeah and go check it out so it's on my website again go to carlis.com k-a-r-a-l-e-i-s-e.com Go to case studies and you look at the case studies there. But also remember that I have a number of other things that you can benefit from on my website. You can go to templates and the templates will have all of these templates that you can download for free. I also have some free courses up here. And of course, go and try to do the fit test. The business analyst fit test is gonna help you determine if you are fit for this career based on this model. Right, so it's just everyday questions. You answer it, takes you around 15 minutes, um, and you get the answer right away, so you don't have to wait. Also, check out my consultation. So if you need help to start your career, or if you need help to prepare for an interview, or if you got a new job and you wanna make sure you, you, know, you impress your boss, right, there's a number of things. Go check on my um, consultation. I have a number of consultations there. Just click on this button that says schedule an appointment. And you can also go get the book, right, go get the book, y'all. Business Analyst Job Market Report. It's on Amazon. You can get it on paperback or on Kindle. And also, if you click on this link in particular, you can get it from um, the website I have for it. That's called bajobmarket.com, www.bajobmarket.com. For some reason, if you don't put the www, it doesn't, it gives an error. I don't know why. People have told me that. But if you buy it from that website, it's cheaper because, you know, Amazon charges you an upcharge, so you have to pass that along. But on the website, it's cheaper. And you also get the resource kit. The BA Career Resource Kit, it has templates, it has case studies with answers, case studies that are not on my website, by the way, additional templates that are not on my website. Um, it has other reports about business analysis and just a whole bunch of stuff that's going to help you to grow your career. And that comes free when you buy it from this website. So www.bajobmarket.com will take you to this page and that's where you can get this book as well, okay? 
So, okay, guys, that's what I have for you today. I hope this was useful, okay? Please like and subscribe. Also, check out my Facebook page, facebook.com slash carolise, and my Facebook group called Real World Business Analysis and IT. All right, thank you, guys. I appreciate you. See you all next time. Take care.